Sexuality is one of the most cruel aspects of being a sentient biological organism. I'm not saying that I think sex is bad, or that sexual attraction to my fellow human beings is juvenile, that would make me a massive hypocrite, but when you think about it from a practical point of view, sexuality is a rather damning burden that most of us are stuck with. It baffles me, then, that we as a society have decided to make sexuality more damning than it already is on its own by introducing none other than, wait for it, societal expectations! Yes, of course! Seriously, Western culture, when will you cease to disappoint? For those of you who don't know, the author of my personal second favourite gothic horror novel of all time, Oscar Wilde, was a bisexual man in late 1800s England. Incidentally, he ended up getting jailed for sodomy, which was illegal back then. If you're straight and you don't understand homosexuality, just draw a diagram of what happens physiologically when you find yourself being attracted to a member of the opposite sex, and then cross out a member of the opposite sex and write in a member of the same sex and you will have an accurate diagram of what gay people find attractive in a partner. Also, if you don't understand what it's like to deny your own sexuality and affect a false persona that better appeals to the homophobic self-righteous tendencies of post-colonialism, then let me introduce you to a friend of mine. His name is Dorian Gray, and he has an interesting story to tell. Basil Hallwood, the personification of Oscar Wilde's artistry, declares that young Dorian Gray is the most beautiful man to have ever existed ever, so beautiful that he paints a portrait of him to preserve his beauty. This leads Lord Henry Wotton, the personification of Oscar Wilde's intellectual cynicism, to remark that Dorian will not be beautiful for very long, and in perhaps five or ten years will already be beginning to suffer the visual degradation that comes with growing older and more worn. Dorian Gray starts getting all existential and wishes upon a star that Basil's painting would bear the visual degradation that he should suffer during his life instead of he. He then decides to live out his entire life before he turns ugly, and goes out and immediately falls in love with an empty-headed actress named Sybil Vane, who has a protective brother named James. Dorian has a short-lived relationship with Sybil in what is probably the greatest satirization of Romeo and Juliet ever, before deciding that Sybil isn't good enough for him and breaks her heart, prompting her to Ophelia herself. Who would have known that the way to satirize Romeo and Juliet was to emulate Hamlet? Dorian notices a slight change in the portrait Basil Hallwood had painted of him, making him realise that his wish upon a star came true. Apparently not only age, but malice and sin rub off on your appearance as well. I didn't know that, but I suppose that's why we have plastic surgery. Eh? Dorian realises that since his portrait will change appearance depending on whether or not he is a virtuous prick or a selfish bastard, that he has stumbled upon what is essentially a KOTOR-style morality meter that will show him whether or not he is a good or evil human being so he shall use the portrait as a moral guide and be the best person he can ever be. But then he really thinks about that and instead decides that since nobody will ever suspect him of crime because his visual appearances will always resemble that of a virtuous person, he will spend the rest of his days as a hedonistic deviant. And I think we all know what that means! Of course, after 18 years, nobody suspects a fucking thing, except Dorian, out of guilt, shows the hideous state of his portrait to Basil, who is horrified, understandably, so Dorian murders him. I mean, why not, while you're channeling Hamlet? Dorian is also tracked down by James Vane, who seeks revenge for the death of his sister, but Dorian outsmarts him and gets away, at which point James slaps himself in the face, runs after Dorian, and ends up accidentally getting himself shot, because he's an idiot. Dorian, of course, dies at the end after he tries to hack his own portrait to pieces, which causes a Mr. Hyde-style spontaneous death. H.P. Lovecraft does this too sometimes, if I remember correctly. What is it with gothic horror authors and spontaneous death? So there are two interpretations for this novel. There is the boring high school analysis present in the first half of the narrative, that the novel is a criticism of Western society's absurd tendencies to value appearance and reputation over substantial values and abilities that actually bring benefits to people's lives. The second interpretation is the one I came up with, and this is really just me being a misty-eyed fanboy of Oscar Wilde, so feel free to ignore everything I say. Dorian Gray is a representation of Oscar Wilde's bisexuality. Dorian engages in activities that would appall mainstream society at the time, however, since nobody knows of the phrased hedonistic vices he performs, he appears virtuous to everybody. His portrait doesn't symbolise morality, it symbolises reputation. Oscar Wilde's activities as a bisexual tarnish his reputation, but only if he were discovered. When Dorian dies, the portrait is restored to its original beautiful state. In layman's terms, the only way for Oscar Wilde to save his reputation was to kill his sexuality. What is incredibly telling is that Dorian Gray, in a fit of fear that his portrait will be revealed, murders the personification of Oscar Wilde's artistry. So that's the picture of Dorian Gray, the definitive insight into a bisexual man's life in a homophobic society.
Let it be known that I don't at all take the human condition seriously, and I believe that both love and lust are the result of biochemicals and neurotransmitters, so sexuality to me is less of an identity label and more of a biological mechanism. I do think our culture would be improved if we lost our tendency to mandatorily link sexuality to individual identity. Anyway, my vocal cords are worn out and I can feel the carpal tunnel syndrome in my hand, so I'll leave you to contemplate that and talk to you next week.